Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Grim Chronicles. This is going to be the wrap up for my reading since last time I talked to you. I know it's midweek and so I think it's going to be number 38. Um, yes, so the book that I really just finished, just finished, which is why I'm so late getting to this video out, was is uh, Magda Zabo's The Door. And um, of course now I've forgotten to check exactly its publication. It, copyright is 1987 and the translation is 2005. So yeah, so it's a novel from the 80s, which kind of makes sense for what I'm going to say about it. This is an absolutely fascinating work of fiction. Uh, my first, I'm pretty sure it's my first Hungarian novel ever. And um, yeah, so, so I'm trying to think, so just in terms of how much I loved it, you know, last week was the big week where I, you know, I read one of the best books of my life and it was Cormac McCarthy's um, Blood Meridian. And so it's not in that league. I don't, I just didn't have, so despite the fact, I think it, it's definitely five stars and it is absolutely fascinating. And I, I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time, but in terms of, but it is more of an intellectual kind of appreciation as opposed to a deeply felt appreciation, um, either for the love of the characters, which is often what carries us along, or in the case of Blood Meridian, just the... I fell in love with the prose writing of Blood Meridian and, and the prose here is very good and it's a translation. It's, it is very good, but it's sort of unassuming. It's not, it doesn't sort of hit you in the face as, with its perfection as Blood Meridian does, but that's because, you know, it's a different type of work. And so even though it, I don't have that deep sort of gut level of love for this novel, I still think, or I still, really rate it very highly and I think it will be thinking about it for a very long time and so um, it focuses on two women and so one of the the reasons why I do you know do appreciate the novel very very much is it's in a certain sense you could read it as a feminist novel uh, it's very much focused only on the women and you have the shadowy figure of the um, narrator who is a writer uh, her husband is a shadowy figure in the background who's not really very, I mean, he, at some point he gets rather sick and then he's, he's also kind of not very helpful. <laughs> he doesn't seem to be, he doesn't play a large role in her, her life, at least as we see it in the novel, maybe, you know, beyond the framework of the novel, things are different. But from what we see in the novel, the other woman in the novel, the main woman of the novel, Emerence is her name, is, um, that's what the whole novel is about. It's about this woman. And of course, the relationship of the narrator, the um, first person narrator, the writer to this woman, Emerence. And so basically, so the, the, the first person narrator is a writer in Hungary in the 80s. And one thing that struck me is, so it's, a, it's, about, it's a novel about a writer, but her writing per se, it's completely um, outside of the framework of the novel. We we don't really ever find out in any kind of specificity what it is she writes. We do find out that her writing is acknowledged at some point. She gets a prize, so and she's sort of sought after to a certain degree. So she becomes well known. Um, but what she's writing, I mean, in a certain sense, you could sort of p p postulate that she's writing this novel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is all about a writer whose writing never sent as, as the focus of the novel. So we're already getting into this. I do think in a certain sense, this is a postmodern, this is a novel of the 80s. Uh, and so what's sort of getting me going is the, the theoretical stuff that is in the novel. So it focuses on these two women, the writer, the intellectual, and Emerence, who is completely the opposite in the sense that she's barely literate. She barely reads. She is uh, older also, um, you know, of, of the working classes, of the, of, of she's not of the intelli intelligentsia. And she is 
very disdainful of the intelligence yeah, and of the woman. So part of what we're already getting into is their weird relationship, which, I mean, certain scenes and aspects of it had seemed kind of toxic. The, the, the Even though, though they're very close and they kind of have strong feelings for each other, they have a hard time expressing them in any kind of non explosive way and so Emerson says a lot of mean things and is strange she's in the, she's one of the strangest characters i've ever met in literature she is a very strange character uh for reasons that i think zebo was trying to you know do something with this novel and so she's not sweet she's not loving she's not with really, she is kind and good but she's very very stern and strict and sort of she the main you know, word that she uses to describe this person that she becomes involved with in a certain sense and becomes, you know, the cleaner of her house is that she says, you're an idiot. You know nothing. You're an idiot. You you know nothing. So she sort of um, is is disdainful and, and scoffs at this person a lot, even though, you know, they get into situations where it's clear that she does feel strongly for her. And, and mainly we hear other people saying how much that Emerence cared for the narrator. They become like the most important people in each other's life, and yet she's always going around and say she's an idiot. <laughs> Which leads me to one of the strains, or one of the theoretical aspects of the novel is I think Emerence does is kind of a stand-in for the mother, the mother, a mother figure for the narrator. And so with all this sort of codependent, I love you, but I think you're, you know, but I want to control your life, you know, all the stuff that mothers and daughters often have kind of is one of the theoretical strains that is coming in here and that kind of is the the relationship develops between the two and so i do think it is a sort of postmodern novel and so one thing we see here so emirates is a cleaner and and so so one thing so emirates cleans and sweeps and she's she's sort of like the epitome of this super capable person and she's more capable at fixing things, at cleaning things, at cooking, at, at, and making a house run than anyone else in the vicinity, and very much more so than the writer. And so what's fascinating about the novel is that it's a novel about, it has nothing to do with, you know, it, it sort of wants to, to focus in on the mundane, on, you know, the fact that the writer cannot keep her house running smoothly in terms of cooking, cleaning, and everything else so that's why she needs emirates to come and clean her house so and you know this is something that we often think about or i often think about the fact that my house is quite neat perhaps but it's not that clean because uh, i've 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 often sort of thought about well maybe i should just get someone to come in and clean my house because i have issues with my health and i'm busy and i don't want to do it <coughs> excuse me um a sip of water here and partly is because I don't want to get into, I don't want, I don't want to establish a relationship with someone in that way where I pay them to clean. To, I just, for some reason, I'd rather just wait and do it when I have time and energy to do it, even if it means that my house isn't that clean. Uh, it's just me. And I know that's just me. That's no, that's, but it is kind of, the, reading this novel has confirmed me in that. It's like, because you, because it's, it does have something to do with boundaries. And that's another strain or th theme of the novel is uh, boundaries and the transgression, transgressing boundaries. And Emirates coming into the house, for one thing, even when they set up the, the contract of, okay, I'll come clean your house, she's, she's very much, she's very bossy. She's very much in control of that. And she's like, well, I have to see if you're someone I want to clean for. And so it's not like, here's money, clean my house. It's more like, well, let me see if I want to clean for you, sort of. So even from the get-go, we have this sort of Turn, switching around of tables in terms of the power dynamics, you know, for, you know, the master slave, whatever, you know, Hegel. So it starts off like that and then it goes and then she decides she does want to clean for them and she does, she does like the lady, I think, but she has a hard time showing in any kind of normal way. And all kinds of bizarre things happen throughout the novel and they're all focused on the strangeness of Emirates and her weird She's sort of moody. She gets into she gets into she gets angry and 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 her anger then expresses itself in the sense that she'll stop cleaning. She'll run away 
and for whatever reason stop stop doing things stop stop it and 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 thereby showing her how everything kind of falls apart when she's not doing what she's supposed to do she's not only a cleaner she's sort of a caretaker she can fix pipes you know she is this ult ultimate super superwoman in a certain sense so she's and she is also apparently sort of able to do this for multiple households and in a way that no one else can no one can do what she does which is you know the super cleaning that she does and so um it sort of is structured along the extremes of she's always described as uh super clean cleanliness being su super put together in her sort of vaguely you know peasant type outfits with this headscarf she always has a headscarf on she's very tall and very strong she's a very strong woman and uh so she, and, and it's all about she's the cl cleanliness and then one of the sort of the, the the other side of that comes into play in the novel. Uh, I won't go into great detail for spoiler reasons, but so the 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 other side of that dirtiness. Um, and here I'm gonna please bear with me, guys. But I am going to bring up a theorist here, and I do think this book is really. This is where I do think it gets into sort of feminist theory type stuff, and that is um, the French Bulgarian theorist Yulia Kristeva, whom I'm not that familiar with, but. You know, even I have come across her theory of the abject and the abject in terms of this essay that she wrote called um, The Power, the Power, uh, the Powers of Horror. Um, and um, yeah, the ab abject. And I'm going to pull up this really useful. So I have, a, uh, I have the essay here that is quite long. It's book length. It's 229 pages. So i uh, go back to you on that one. But I did find a good um, teaching website that kind of go goes into what the abject is. So um, according to Julia Kristeva in this essay or this book called The Powers of Horror, um, the abject refers to the human reaction, so either horror or vomit, to a threatened breakdown in meaning caused by the loss of the distinction between the subject and object or between self and other, the primary examples of which causes such reactions as the corpse, uh, which traumatically reminds us of our own materiality. However, other items can elicit the same reaction, the open wound, shit, sewage, even the skin that forms the, 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 on the surface of warm milk, which always does give me the heebie-jeebies, I don't know about you. So, so honing in on this idea of a breakdown in meaning, and we really kind of see this playing out in the novel, I think, because the, 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 the narrator becomes so obsessively connected to Emirates and and sort of experience the the the, 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 the horror as as things kind of break down in ways I won't get into for spoilery reasons. Um, we see the power of horror with with this relationship in a certain sense, and um, it goes into yes. Don't worry, I'm not going to bring in Lacan. Although although I do think even so, we're getting into sort of post structural takes on uh, psychoanalysis. And even, you know, going back to more traditional psychoanalysis, the idea of the Ur mother, this, this over, this arcade, and, and another term that comes up in this description of the powers of horror is this idea of archaic memory. So primitive, pre, pre-civilized uh, memory coming into play with, with the Ur mother, this, this sort of judge, a, a judging, um, figure that that, that uh, takes control of your life in a certain sense and so that brings me to now I'm going back to my very un, unsought out very off the cuff little notes about the book so we have cleanliness and dirtiness and the abject kind of those extremes we also have love and hate which are almost kind of completely intertwined love and hate go together in this novel and it's so funny how compared to her very sort of mild relationship to her husband, which of course is also a love relationship. I mean, I'm not denying that, but but it's just very sort of in the background, very much on the back burner in this novel, whereas whereas Emerence and our narrator kind of lock together in this, this weird, whatever you want to call it, relationship. Strong emotions, attachment and detachment. So being very attached and then, you know, breaking that bond. And so the other thing, going back to the archaic memory stuff is 
um, even the so and and it's sort of connected to the transgression stuff sorry to be weirdly vague here but <laughs> um, so animals play a key part in this novel and this is the connection to drive drive my plows so the role of animals specifically um, pets so animals you bring into your home so we have the dog Viola who for reasons is a male dog called Viola who's very strange <laughs> it's a very strange dog I'm not an ex dog expert but Viola is you know almost treated like a human in, and, and acts almost like a human. And whereas sometimes Amaranth and her connection to the family, to mainly the woman, the narrator, who I don't think has a name, does almost feel like the relationship that we have to dogs. I mean, I'm not, not, not entirely, but there are certain scenes in this book where Amaranth and almost seems like, a, you know, like there is one scene where she, she basically nibbles at the hand of the narrator but it's kind of like to show her affection i know it sounds weird and it is weird but just like a dog might kind of nibble your or cats do that too they kind of lick and nibble to show their love so you know the, the so animals and and also the emirates's um relationship to animals is 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 very benevolent and she's a caretaker of the animals and she's also a bit of a hoarder um yeah her relation so yeah so yeah animals is, and and so the animal human divide which is something i talk about in my when i teach fairy tales so the way we um kind of convince ourselves that we're civilized is that we are not like animals so we don't eat like animals and if you do eat in a kind of messy way you are called a pig for example so you know we use animal metaphors as an in an insulting way because it's a form of othering and so um there is this constant even that sort of boundary is transgressed in this novel a little bit or blur the the distinctions between the animal and the human become blurred a little bit specifically around eberance and even emirates is a very strange name i mean i get i i hear in that that word emergence emerging you know identities forming things like that um so yeah, animals, our relationships to each other and to animals and, you know, creating and transgressing boundaries between animals. And um, I, I had, yeah, the one last thing I'll say is, this is also a novel very much about our domestic spaces, but also in a very sort of theoretical way. And Emerence's relationship to her domestic space is supremely weird and Kafkaesque, I hate to use that word, but it is sort of, and one weird example of that is that, so she's this super capable, strong woman who seems never to get tired. And then she retires to her strange home that she never lets anyone into. You know, we have, it's called the door. Um, and then, but we do enter into it eventually. And so one thing we find out is she has no bed. She just kind of falls asleep and takes naps in the love seat that she has. So she doesn't even have a bed. What is that about? Like. Like, is it a sign of her being like an animal that she doesn't have a bed or just something that makes her not seem normal and not human? I don't know exactly. I haven't figured that out. And so, yeah, so it's also a novel about domestic spaces and how we interact in them and about, yeah, all the stuff I've been chatting about for already 18 minutes. So you can see it's, it has affected me deeply, this novel, this definitely, and it is definitely a five-star novel. I have to say, for all the fact, for all that I've read fewer books than I would have liked this year, I have really read some fantastic ones. And I think from here on out, I'm going to focus more on quality over quantity, just because, you know, life's too short for just reading stuff to, for numbers. So I'm really glad I got it done. And sorry for the kind of excursions into theory a little bit, but I do think it is a book that kind of got goes in those directions and you know even something like the abject you know powers of horror it does re also remind me of blood meridian there's a lot of abject stuff going on there too so, you know you know blood and guts and you know corpses so and our inter and what these you know what this means in terms of the symbolic or whatever so yeah so enough about that and so i'm kind of I'm, i have my new audio book which is um i think i'll save I'll, I'll just mention a little bit, but I won't talk a lot about it because it's already getting kind of late. Um, it's called The Fortnight in September, and it's actually 
going to be published as a Persephone. Well, maybe, no, 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 it's been published. It's been published. It's, it's number 67. No, it's been out for a while. But I just kind of got on it because my husband told me that uh, Kazuo Ishiguro had said uh, it is just about the most uplifting life affirming novel I can think of right now in the summer of 2020. I, I think it has more of a, dust, a, a melancholy vibe to it when I'm just listening to it because um, so it's a very sweet uh, depiction of this lower middle class British family going on their summer holiday and we enter into the sort of stream of consciousness as it were of, of the characters and and it's very sweet in a certain sense and it is the descriptions of nature and the writing is quite is quite literary and, and beautiful but one thing you do kind of see if when you're going into the stream of consciousness of everyone is how disconnected they are from each other like everyone is just kind of having on their own little track of thoughts and there's not a lot of sharing of that in the world which i guess is normal but um, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit like it would be nice if they were able to connect a little bit more, but maybe, maybe I'm still fairly, I, they're not even at the, at the place where they're having their holiday yet, so maybe that will happen, or maybe there'll be some kind of resolution, but I could sort of see, it does have a bit of an Ishiguro-esque feel to it, um, so I could see why he liked it, and I'm enjoying it very much, the reading, it's just a delightful listen, I have to say, and, and, and ni a nice sort of refresher after um, Canal Scarred, who I still love the novel, but the bit that I hadn't heard yet before, I, I know I already talked about it last week, was him growing up and becoming more pre pre prepescent and then just prepescent, and his obsession with girls does become a little bit less, um, what's the word? Um, it's just not as it's it, I mean it's still good and he's still good about the, the relationship between the genders but it is very sort of uh, focused on this young boy and his inability to really connect to the female I mean and it just uh, gets a little bit tiring <laughs> hearing all about his obsessions with the girls on the other hand his obsession with women oh, at that stage, in this young stage, do, do, it does seem rather Proustian. He's obsessed with the idea of these women and not really with them themselves, which is kind of interesting. And also he's obsessed with the sexual side of things, so the bodies and stuff, so. Um, but still, it was a great, it was a great listen too. So yeah, I am very busy with work and I'm going to be, you You know, this is going to continue, but I'm still committed to making these videos. But the, oh yes, no, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, it's already 22 minutes and I am going to be talking about Vic Victoria related things. And I really would like to make an extra video, but it may also just enter into my weekly wrap ups. So stay tuned for Victoria related things. And it may even, because I have genealogical connections, you know, I have Victo Victoba people in my family um, who wrote novels, not well known, you know, definitely third, fourth tier, you know, very, but this is the thing about Victorian literature is that there is so much of it and it's not all, you know, Charles Dickens and Trollope and there's a lot of stuff that we, it, you know, that is is below them and that is sort of still around. It's so kind of interesting. And for me, my stuff's interesting because it's connected to my family and it might also be interesting for you guys. So for some of you at least. And so, yeah, stay tuned for that. I am already at 23 minutes. I'm going to get this one up and I will talk to you very soon. And let me know if you're interested in reading it, if you have read it. It's a fascinating work of literature. Five stars for me. I will talk to you next week. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.